Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Adil Abdullahi, and I want to welcome you to this evening's um, session. Sorry, my pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm a faculty member at the School of Disability Studies. I bring you greetings from my fellow colleagues at the School of Disability Studies and the Faculty of Community and Social Services. It is my pleasure to be here with you today and to welcome you to our final in a series of five panel discussions in the Black Ocular series. Before I continue, I will go ahead and mute my video um, and read the rest of the text. Thank you. So I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. As we gather here today and listen to the speakers share their thinking, reflection, and learning on their perspectives and the engagement and engage in critical discussion. We acknowledge, uh, we acknowledge that the School of Disability Studies is on Treaty 13 territory. Uh, uh, sorry, we acknowledge that the School of Disability Studies is on Treaty 13 territory, a treaty that was as was established between the Mississauga of the Mississauga of the Credit River um, and the British Crown. We are surrounded by Treaty 13A, Treaty 20, also known as the Williams Treaty, and Treaty 19. Today, I speak with you from the city called Toronto, which is in the Dish with One Spoon territory, which is the treaty between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabeg, including all including all allied nations to peaceably share and protect the resources around the Great Lakes. While those of us who are not indigenous to this land have arrived here as settlers on indigenous territories in different ways, and we acknowledge that some we acknowledge that some of our ancestors and elders were forcibly placed displaced people brought here involuntarily or by force, particularly for those brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We acknowledge that we are all treaty people and that, and that we are all grateful to be working and living on this land. The School of Disability Studies is an undergraduate degree completion program with a robust record of postdoctoral studies. The school has a strong commitment to equity and justice for disabled, mad, and deaf people, but it's also oriented to the affirmative and desirable trouble that desire, desirable trouble that disability, madness, and deafhood afford all of us. Together, we bring our bodies and our minds to critically reflect on the impact of surveillance, containment, public resistance, and many other themes that have been addressed throughout this series. Past titles of panels have included Policing Ecologies and Lessons from the Plantation, uh, Understanding Black Women and Non-Binary People's Lives Today, Race Medicine Algorithm and Artificial Intelligence, and, tra and Transnational Geographies, Gender Violence and the Movement of Black Women and Non-Binary People, Peoples. Tonight's panel, the fifth of the, fi the fifth the fifth and final one takes up responses from disabled, queer, trans, Black people uh, to increase surveillance and the role of research and big data in education and healthcare, specifically as it impacts and intersects with the experiences of Black students, researchers, and those interested in the outcomes of Black people um, in these areas. Disabled, Black, and queer people have always found ways of surviving and resisting, and resisting violent systems. Uh, this panel will offer some current research, some current research and interventions that create the livable ways and bring forward disabled, queer, and trans uh, disabled, queer, and trans people within education and healthcare settings. This work today comes to us by way of a social sciences and humanities research Count council of Canada connections grant, and so we want to make sure that we thank them along with the contributions from the School of Disability Studies and the Faculty of Community and, so Community and Social Services at Toronto Metropolitan University. Before we begin with the panel tonight, I would like to go over a few access notes. If you would like to access our live captioning, please click the CC button. There are a few ways for you to participate in tonight's panel discussion. First, please feel free to use the chat box and ask questions and ask questions directly to the panelists and to and to the fellow 
um, attendees. Please note that the chat box is automatically uh, populated for messages to the panelists only. Um, during the Q&A portion, we ask you to use the, uh, we ask you to, um, for the Q&A portion, if you would like to speak using audio, please press the hand raise button and we will enable your microphone at the appropriate time. If you would like to use video for your question, please message the host in the chat and we'll ensure that you can participate that way. Um, towards the end, Zoom also has the Q and, uh, question and answer function. Use this feature uh, for you to ask questions in the Q&A box. You can also ask questions anonymously. In addition, if you would like to use social media to engage in today's panel, please feel free to tag the discussion at Black Oculars at B-A-L-C-K-O-C-U-L-A-R-S at Twitter. Um, thank you. We are lucky this evening that we have Apollo who will be live tweeting today's panel. So do please feel free to um, follow that account. Uh, finally, it took tremendous work to bring this evening together and, and, the, fi and the five part series more generally. This has come together uh, collectively due to the phenomenal work of the team, the students, the staff and the research assistants. I want to extend deep, deep gratitude to Tally, who is the School of Disability Studies Public Lab Coordinator, um, AI Media, um, Apollo, Amber, and Maddie, who are working on uh, the research team. Um, and thank you again to all of my colleagues who've supported this project. And most of all, to the speakers this evening, uh, Tanitia, Yasmin, um, and to uh, CN, as well as um, to our live captioners and Luke as well. So with no further ado, um, I'd like to welcome um, our, our first speaker this evening, um, Tanitia um, Monroe. Um, Tanitia Monroe's scholarship and research is focused on African and African Caribbean ABC youth and family schools experiences, schooling experiences in Canada using an anti-colonial and uh, critical race and queer Black feminist theorizing. Monroe has published and continues to present at various conferences, both locally um, and inter locally and internationally uh, to disseminate on issues and themes related to Canadian K-12 education policies, racial trauma in education, and post-secondary education, PSE, access for ACB youth. Um, thank you so much, Tanitia, and welcome to uh, the discussion this evening. Thank you, um, Adele, for such a warm welcome. Um, Luke, if you don't mind uh, bringing up my slide, thank you. <laughs> right. Um, first, I'd like to do a bit of self-description. So I am a Black woman with waist-length dreadlocks that is colored in different shades of brown. I'm also wearing a Black-rimmed glasses. I sport gold braces. I am wearing a black t-shirt with a white print. And last but not least, I navigate this world as a partially sighted black queer Jamaican woman. Next slide, please. So um, in thinking about um, what I wanted to talk to my audience today, everyone today, you know, I, I first wanted to locate myself in the work that I do. Um, and as a Black queer woman researcher, I think about the ways in which I do research, the process, the production, and the outcomes of inquiry. And how do I represent the students and communities when I con conduct research? And, and for sure, their, their families as well. You know, we understand that Black women as researchers and the research, right? And therefore we bring our lived experiences and our realities to the research process. For me and the work I do, I intentionally try to capture and illustrate nuanced differences that sit among students and their families while they negotiate K-12 spaces. And more import importantly, I think about their social and their material conditions and try to bring forth an alternative analysis for referencing their schooling experiences. I also think about the ways in which 
you know, um, in my work, I rely on the voices of Black students and their families. Um, and these are conscious choices that I, I, I grapple with, that I do. Um, and it's my everyday attempt when I'm, I'm thinking through data, you know, um, and the ways in which um, I, I, I don't want to be complicit um, in their stories and their experiences. And, you know, I also think about um, my obligations. Then when I was a mom going through this work, you know, when I, before I became a researcher at my board, what I used to do, how I used to critique um, the data that, it, that represented my kids, right? So today, before, tomorrow, it will always re remain the same, right? I have to be extra vigilant in, in the ways that I critique data and how it is produced, now that I'm in the position that I'm in. Next slide, please. So data sits at the center of power, right? And data can either serve as both an engine for change or a proponent of the status quo. You know, as Black students orient themselves around a normative social order within their schools, they may not be aware of how data continues to reflect discourses of marginalization, risk, and exclusion. The choices about how we put our trust in data, what to believe, why something is true, um, are not benign issues. Um, instead, these concerns tap the fundamental questions of what versions of truth will prevail and what will shape um, thought and action data. And we also have to consider how teachers internalize these dominant narratives in the ways that rationalize inequity and exclusion in K-12 spaces, rather than acknowledging oppression and as system, systemic and structural. Um, for me, Black students, when I think about it, and I always reference being a parent, right? Negotiating the system when my kids were there, right? Um, black students, may come to understand various forms of power or um, domination in education spaces as being natural or at least unchangeable and therefore unquestioned. And I think that goes for many parents and caregivers, you know, and family members that, that don't know how to navigate um, or negotiate um, the K-12 spaces. So for me, what do these big data sets reveal about Black students' experience and how they fear out in schools? How are we, um, how are people and myself included um, analyzing um, data, especially understanding the impact it has on black students who encounter, you know, school discipline, right? Streaming, right? Being labeled, the standardized test, how it is understood, how, is, how are they used? What does it highlight? What does it minimize? What story does it tell, right? It's not far reaching to think that the idea of many of these assessments and data is often used to neutralize or regulate their experience. One has to go beyond the narrow view of, of the implications around education inequities that, surface, that surfaces through data. And for me, you know, as long as data practices continue to draw upon narratives that rarefy damaging social norms and hierarchies, students will continue to be positioned within discriminatory and inequitable spaces. Next slide, please. Assigning new, numerical value to black life is something that I, I think everybody here um, thinks about. Um, you know, it's how it has transformed experiences into information or data, and it's nothing new for black people or communities. You know, Black students' lives are often reduced to forms of accounting. I think about the historical and contemporary ways that Black youth, like their adult counterparts, are hailed by big data that reduce their lives to mere numbers. Through these numbers and percentages, Black youth experiences are captured, predicted, justified, and controlled. You know, they appear as commodities, revenue streams, so funding, statistical deviation, benchmarks, so improved learning assessments, special education, and vectors of risk. Again, school discipline, right? So the dangers for me emerges when 
And if researchers and educators do not engage in a process that can circumvent mis misinterpretations, misinformation, and misrepresentations of individuals, communities, institutions, and system. Um, so it goes back to the politics of their identity and how it becomes a central part of their experience. It's never one dimensional or monolithic and, and for black youth to find themselves navigating anti-black racism and discrimination in various ways, oftentimes come through big data. Next slide, please. So the system always prefers system compatibility and that's just the truth, right? We have to examine how data um, does in fact um, reproduce um, status quo, you know? What happens when a child does not fit neatly in, in the created categories prescribed by them? You know, I think about the narration and interpretation of data. For example, I think about how educators use data to normalize conceptions of differences, access, and belonging, right? K to 12 education, you know, schools and classroom are used as the data platforms where a wide range of data is used to track, sense, analyze technologies are being mobilized and weaponized. Students' lived experiences have been quantified into data to predict their academic outcomes, manage their behavior, assign meanings to their Black identity, you know, their differences, their desires, their knowledge, their social work, and their possibilities are assimilated and contested and oftentimes erased. For Black students who live and have been quantified into these data categories. You know, we, un we see many, many times how it predicts their academic outcomes. You know, um, their differences and everything is just a part of their, the normal way they negotiate spaces in K-12 education. Next slide, please. So addressing the complexity of research and data. You know, I often encounter two distinct approaches um, when I'm doing my work, one representing the interests of the institution and the other expressing my, the concerns I, I have, right? How do we better do a better job of representing Black students in their controlled knowledge validation process? Like, how do we do it using data? You know, I often think, you know, I'm in this, this I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place because I'm, I'm part of the system. I am the system. You know, I, I, I go between that I'm, I'm an insider, outsider, right? So, you know, as a Black queer woman researcher, you know, I try to make the move from what is to what could be and how could I reimagine um, the process? So for me, you know, we have to consider how data inscribes certain meanings. You know, we can think about the education experiences um, for, for students who are not white, middle class, able body, heterosexual, and how that diminishes because they more often than likely face discrimination. And, and, and they, you know, I'm talking about black youth, indigenous youth, you know, racialized youth, right? Harassment and exclusion. And, and, and I go, I can delve into that further when I pick data apart and look at the experiences of black students. So is the use of large data sets in K-12 education able to ex seed historical and contemporary understandings of Black students as they, as anything more than damaged and broken, you know, and entire communities depleted, you know, like we don't have any social worth, we have no social capital, we're not coming with anything. So I'm often asking myself that, right? And I also ask what difference does it make when the researchers doing the work hail from communities that experience a particular type of racial violence and anti-blackness. So what does that mean for me? Because I'm part of the community too. My kids are part of the community, right? We know the experiences should be valid, but in an evidence-based data-driven environment, experiences are dismissed. And that's the truth, you know? But these are some of the tensions that I grapple with. Next slide, please. So how do I rethink education um, research using student voice? You know, and this part gives me uh, much joy, right? Because a part of the disruption for me is, is, 
is embedded in the work that I do with black students. You know, we cannot dismiss how research is done and applied and how it tends to elevate the individual over the community. And we're not from that as black people, right? Knowledge is from academic and professional research-based institutions have long valued over the have been long valued over the organic. So the storytelling, you know, and everything that we come from, the root of our own knowledge production, right? We're recognizing that um, I can never fully tell the, the story or be named as an expert in how they experience school. I have been using alternative methods to center black students' voices. And I do that through youth participatory action research. So for me, it, in, you know, um, YPAR in short, it, it engages in this rigorous research inquiry. So I teach um, students how to be junior researchers, right? And, and so the power and the knowledge, uh, knowledge production shifts from out of the institution and into the hands of black youth. You know, so by centering their voices, you know, I make, I'm making them co-designers in their education. And this is something that we try to do each year in a program that I, that I support, right? So the foundation, we know that um, the path forward um, in supporting black youth um, is by virtue of improving their achievement and well-being. But it's, it shouldn't be in an afterthought, you know, nothing without us, nothing for us without, without us, right? And I often say, say this in spaces that, you know, students are the biggest stakeholders, but they're, they're never at the tables for the decision, right? And that needs to shift. And one of the ways that I shift it is through um, YPAR, because when they take on a collective project like that, there is, there is a refusal right? And it's through their, their engagement with it, they're able to critique the world, you know, they, they start learning how to analyze, look at things differently, right? And, and, in, and within YPAR, it, you know, it's almost like they insist that any form of like discrimination um, or anti-Blackness they encounter, um, that's not natural. And they can start naming it, they can start pointing things out, right? Next slide, please. And finally, um, for me, um, users of data must take responsibility. That's for that's that's the least we can do. You know, we must take re responsibility for its effects. Um, it requires us to be exposed to theories, perspectives, views, positions, and discourses that emerge from the experiences and point of view of black communities, families, and, 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 and black researchers. Because our ordinary way of producing data plays a significant role in making up meaning of black students in K-12 education. And we can't do it without an ethics of care. You know, and it supports the extraordinary activity of discrimination and anti-black racism that is normalized and reproduced as part of their story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanitia. Uh, that was uh, such a phenomenal presentation. Um, and I really appreciate the ways that you um, took up and also explained how uh, predictive technology and like predictive surveillance is used within, um, within K-12 K to education. I'm not sure that that is certainly something that individuals think about often. Um, but also how research is weaponized. Um, so I have a lot more questions for you, but I, I, I'll make sure I, 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 I bring this back hopefully in the discussion um, and, and I'll, I'll have our, our next speaker go, but thank you again so much, uh, Tanitia, for, for your contributions. Um, um, I'd like to now welcome our second speaker, uh, Yasmin Gray. Yasmin Gray is a writer, artist, researcher, educator, and public speaker based in Toronto, Ontario. 
Yasmin has worked at Toronto Metropolitan University as a research assistant in the School of Disability Studies and as a research assistant on several projects related to anti-Black racism, curriculum development, and inclusive pedagogy. A scholar and lifelong learner of Black Disability Studies, Yasmin holds a master's degree in critical disability studies from York University. She enjoys listening to audiobooks and podcasts related to disability, health, and public policy. Yasmin's writing has been published in Toronto Star, The Grid, Briar Patch, and far much more. I'd like to go ahead and welcome Yasmin next, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Adele, for the warm introduction. Uh, this, uh, I'm being asked to take a two minute break. So we can take a two minute break right now. That's perfectly fine. I can Thank start at 629. Thank you for, so much for that, Yasmin. And just for the audience, we're going to take a quick break for um, our ASL interpreter. Thank you. Okay, um, so I see that Yasmin's uh, screen is back on. So I'll go ahead and welcome everybody back. And Yasmin, if you wanna feel free to uh, begin now. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Adil, for the warm introduction. Um, I'm gonna ask Luke to present my PowerPoint slides. Thank you, Luke. My presentation today is titled, The Case for Resisting Surveillance in Education, learning from the narratives of Black disabled youth. Before I speak any further, I'm gonna do a quick um, image description. So right now I'm on your screen. I am a young black woman with my hair in black locks. I'm wearing a pink oversized t-shirt and my background is blurred, but you can see a lamp and a cabinet in the background. Um, my presentation is going to be around 15 minutes long. We can go on to the next slide, Luke, please. Um, I'm just gonna be doing a little bit of an introduction, covering some narratives that I thought were relevant to this topic, analyzing those narratives, and then wrapping up with some final words. I do have a tendency to speak fairly quickly, so I'm going to be conscious of that and slow it down. Um, we can go on to the next slide. As Adil shared, my name is Yasmin Simone Gray, pronouns she and her. And the thing I just wanted to highlight is a slight correction that I have worked as a teaching assistant in the School of Disability Studies, but not a research assistant yet. 
So we can go on to the next slide. Um, so this slide is speaking around surveillance and surveillance is the act of tracking, tracing, monitoring and capturing a group of people's movements or everyday dealings. In the education system, this can look, this can look, uh, this can appear in different ways. It can look like monitoring student social media accounts, CCTV in schools, police school partnerships, recording students who are taking tests at home. Um, as Tanitia explained in her own presentation, it may also look like the collection or over collection of student data. Um, schools are a place where um, a lot of data and a lot of personal information can be collected from young people, including information around their academic performance, their mental health and well being, their racial and ethnic backgrounds, their family makeups, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I was presented with the idea for today's panel, I started to think about my relationship to surveillance and education. And so the first place that I went was I thought about my experience in K-8 education growing up in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I also thought beyond that, deeper than that, to when I was doing my undergraduate studies as a young adult and I was working with Black youth in a social justice um, after school program. And as an adult, I was having a different relationship to surveillance, but still being surveilled. And I want to, I can talk about the nuances and the distinctions of what it was like to be surveilled as a student versus as an adult educator. But um, that might be something that I either revisit at the end of the presentation or certainly in the Q&A if that interests folks. Um, but the one thing that was most salient to me that stood out the most was I was really thinking about my encounters with police at our school, our, my K-8 school, and their role in monitoring our social media. And I will be sharing two stories related to that with you all today. Um, I'll go on to the next slide, Luke, please and thank you. So. There are a lot of myths that surround the justification for why greater surveillance in schools is necessary. Um, as you can, as, as what's presented on this slide is that some of those myths include the idea that surveillance keeps us safer, protected, and is a completely neutral objective process that impacts everyone equally. But black and brown communities understand that that is not true. Um, folks from marginalized backgrounds understand that that is not true. Um, it's not a neutral process, and it does not prevent youth violence in the ways that sometimes it's incorrectly touted to. Um, so surveillance, like policing, is, is often viewed as violence prevention. We see it on the news, we see it from politicians, and greater policing and greater surveillance is often viewed as a knee-jerk reaction to violence in schools. But the question that many advocates are asking and the ways that advocates push against this is why are we treating children like they're up to no good? Why are we monitoring children um, as if they are trying to pull one over us or harm us in a school setting? Um, so when people talk about how surveillance increases safety, we really need to ask whose safety is being centered in that statement? Who gets to feel protected? Black youth navigating multiple forms of oppression have the experience of being hyper surveilled in schools by teachers, school administrators, police, and even other community members. They experience the surveillance in school, outside of school, and even online as the next two narratives are going to illustrate. And that's significant because it sends a message uh, to black youth that they don't belong in schools or are not wanted there. It also paints black youth as being a threat and that does not promote their safety or well-being um, or sense of belonging in school by any means. The true impact of increased surveillance in school is greater experiences of anti-Black racism, discrimination, exclusion, and criminalization of Black youth. So I'm going to ask that we share the next slide, please, Luke. And I'm going to state that the narratives that I will be discussing today have been anonymized. So I've removed any identifying details and call people by different names. Um, just so that their privacy is protected. So again, one of the early experiences I thought of when I was presented with this presentation um, 
is in sixth grade when a police officer came to visit our school. And he asked one of the students in my class, a Somali boy who was age 11, to log into his social media. And then he asked the boy um, if he was allowed, like once he logged in, the cop wanted to know if he was allowed to go through the social media and the child said yes. So he went through the profile photos, which were perfectly inoffensive and then proceeded to describe um, this young black boy as threatening and a bully and said that the unsmiling photos on his profile made him look mean. Um, there was one particular photo of the boy and his friends outside in the winter and the cop said it looked like the kid was pushing his friend down on the ground. So at the end of the so-called educational activity, the cop asked for the child's permission to add him to Facebook so that the cop and the, the boy could be friends. And although like these experiences were very normalized and normal and part of our everyday educational experiences when I was growing up, um, looking back, I'm asking, why does a cop need to be Facebook friends with a young black boy in Scarborough at 11 years of age? And although the police officer asked for consent at different steps of the, the way, it's not really reasonable for an 11 year old to be able to understand the ramifications of inviting that kind of surveillance and monitoring into their lives. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but I'll then go on to narrative two so we can change slides. Um, while attending the same school, just the following year, I knew about another boy who we're going to call Damien. Damien was a young black boy with learning disabilities. I'll go through this a little, I'll, I'll kind of be concise, but um, Damien liked to play basketball, but he was kicked off the team because they wanted him to pull his grades up. Um, he was older than me, he was a class clown. Um, he often got in trouble for being loud and bubbly from the teachers. They always wanted to quiet down. One thing I remember about Damien is that students would put things in his Afro during learning time when he was faced away from them, the, they did that. They wanted to see if he would notice. So you can see anti-Blackness in that and harassment ongoing that he was experiencing. Um, and he would react to this reasonably by being angry and only his anger was uh, policed in school, not so much the what, what precipitated that reaction. Um, yeah, so we can continue on to the next slide. So Damien had a girlfriend another girl in his grade. And this is a time, obviously, eighth grade where many students are experimenting with their first romantic relationships. And Damien was observed kissing his girlfriend outside um, on the playground. And essentially the lunch supervisor noticed. And so he and other students who were doing the same thing with their girlfriends and boyfriends were reprimanded and parents got called. Later that night, Damien posted on Facebook saying, uh, expressing frustration at being in trouble and students involved in the situation as well as students not involved in the situation were expressing their sympathies. Damien expressed that he wanted to egg the grade eight teacher's car because that was the teacher that had punished him. The comment, the post that he made received lots of likes from his peers. The following day, the teacher said that a student reported the comments um, that had been made on Facebook. And she proceeded to print off pages and pages of the Facebook interactions. She consulted with the seventh grade teacher and the school principal, and they all decided to escalate the matter to police. The grade eight teacher was seen crying and saying that she feared for her safety because Damien knows where her car is in the parking lot and could egg her car. So all the students who had commented on the post or liked the post were in trouble. The grade eight teacher, sorry, the grade eight class lost their end of year graduation trip uh, because the majority of the class had interacted in some way with the Facebook post. Another grade eight student who was up for an end of year academic award was also threatened uh, that the award would be taken away uh, because of their interactions on Damien's post. So we can go on to the next slide and analyze some of what happened. Um, in Damien's narrative, we can really see how hyper surveillance in schools is correlated with increased rates of suspensions among black youth. Damien was located in the, at the intersections of race, class, gender, and disability. Um, I may not have mentioned earlier, but 
our area was one that was low income. Damien lived in community housing. Um, so these are also things that uh, interacted and influenced the situation in terms of how teachers were interacting with Damien. Um, most of the teachers that we interacted with at school did not live in our area at all. They traveled two to three hours each day to come to our school. And they viewed us and our families as occupying the lowest rungs of the social hierarchy. And therefore they looked at us as undeserving of the kind of care that white affluent people would get. Um, so they really looked down on us like majority racialized people who they were, who they were tasked to teach. Um, looking at this narrative through an intersectional and critical lens, we can see how Damien was subjected to harsher discipline and control. He was disciplined and shamed for his sexual expression, constantly disciplined for his loud voice in the classroom, and then further disciplined for his self-expression on the internet, but also for his ability to garner empathy from other students, which I thought was important because it was interesting that that became part of the punishment and part of the story that the grade eight teacher led with. Um, you can see that in this narrative, just the simple act of liking the post, which is pretty digitally innocuous, still, um, you know, earned the mire of the grade eight teacher, um, who again, you know, amplified concerns by saying that her life was being threatened when the simple fact of the matter was he was frustrated and posted about egging her car. Um, and like that narrative can sound unbelievable, just thinking that no adult involved in the situation said anything to stop or challenge what was happening. But it's not that un unbelievable when you factor in how our educational institutions from K to eight and nine to 12 treat disabled, black and economically disadvantaged students like this every single day. That's part of the everyday lives and everyday daily experiences um, to be surveilled, to be policed, to be criminalized within school. And that's not right. So we're gonna go on to the next slide. I wanted to really unpack how we can reflect on narratives like the two I've presented here today. And I may be able to present a third one, but we'll see. Um, and I wanted to really think about how we can use those reflections to help shift how we interact with and advocate for black disabled young people. Um, and I wanna like really make clear that neither of the stories that I described had to be the way that they were. In the first narrative where I talked about the cop adding the kid on Facebook, there is an opportunity for the educator in the room to, to challenge and disrupt and completely stop the framing of a black child as dangerous and threatening and a bully and, you know, really interrogate which lens this cop is using to make these assessments. The cop was making really bold claims that um, not only were those assessments true, but that other people would believe that as well, because that was the messaging around um, the presentation to be mindful of how you present online. Um, an anti-oppressive educator would be able to see how this student was characterized, mind you, in a room full of his peers as appalling and as racist and a and a, and a huge and significant example of anti-Blackness in school and advocate for the school to not continue their partnership with police. It's really important to understand that police presence does not make, does not make schools safer and it does not prevent violence. Instead, it just provides police with further access and closer access to marginalized, criminalized, and stereotype Black children um, as reflected honestly in both of the stories that I um, presented. Flipping over, to look at Damien's narrative, there was multiple entry points where any educator could have stepped in and disrupted what was happening. So the seventh grade teacher, the eighth grade teacher, and the school principal were the ones most involved in terms of calling the police and uh, really consulting around what to do. But other teachers were also aware of the situation um, because we had to be like supervised by another um, educator while this whole while the three of them dealt with the the problem. The problem. I'm putting that in quotes um, for folks who can't see me doing that. Um, because we really have to reorient, reorient ourselves to what the problem is. I think in that narrative, most people listening can understand that the problem was not a young person venting their frustrations on Facebook. The problem very clearly lies with the adult educators who decided to take that experience and um, really use it as an opportunity to criminalize a young Black person. Um, and I would say that any, ed any educator, any educator, sorry, who would rather see a Black youth intimidated and criminalized by police 
then have her car need a little wash later, if that were even the case, should not be working in education. So instead of escalating matters to police, there were multiple opportunities to talk to Damien about relationships, sex and sexuality, and allow him an outlet to vent his frustrations about how he's being, being treated in school from the anti-Blackness that he was experiencing um, with, with what was what was being put into his Afro as a quote unquote joke, uh, to being shamed when he got caught kissing his girlfriend, to also being constantly reprimanded by educators for being too loud. This is a child, and that is that was very lost in the in the response to to the Facebook post and the response to all these different things. And that happens really often as as we know that black boys and black girls aren't often afforded boyhood or girlhood. We're adultified from very early ages. And with three minutes left, I believe I have time to squeeze in um, a third narrative. The third narrative is not on the slides. I'm just gonna speak to you about it. But when I, I have experience as an after-school educator and I used to work in different schools all across Toronto and walking in as a young, young adult, and you know, depending on what I'm wearing on the day, I could even be mistaken for a youth at times when I used to do that work. But for the most part, because I'm walking in as an educator with this job to do, I was seen, teachers like trusted me, ad admin trusted me. So sometimes I would be able to hear comments that I wouldn't have otherwise been privy to, say as a student or as a child. So I got to understand how um, the young people that I was working with who were predominantly black um, were experiencing all kinds of anti-blackness and surveillance in their schools. We like our approach in that after school program was really to do outreach to the black kids at the school that you could tell were kind of on the outside of things on the outskirts like maybe not necessarily eating in the cafeteria, but making their own space in the hallway, making their own space like outdoors, whatever it was, right? Like really connecting with them in a different way. And teachers were really perplexed by that. Teachers would pop their head into our after school program and, you know, ask me like, you know, gesture over to me to come over because they couldn't figure out why so-and-so is in that program. How is so-and-so so good with you when so-and-so quote unquote causes so much trouble in my classroom? We even had experiences where teachers would come into the classroom and sit cross-legged um, to listen and to try to, you know, see what kind of information we were telling students. And it was a social justice education program. And what we would do, one way that we would resist that is having experienced it a couple times um, myself and students came up with a, um, like, uh, a kind of way to behave when the educators did that to make them leave. So <laughs> that was like an easy way to get rid of them. And like, everyone kind of knew, like when the signal was enacted and then they ended up leaving because they had no interest in staying. And then we were able to have our space again. So that was one way that we handled surveillance, but it was interesting to be, um, in part another end of it because at some in some respects they were surveilling myself and the program that I was leading but mostly they were surveilling these quote unquote children that they felt they couldn't understand how we as facilitators could have such positive relationships with them when they um, in their classrooms were so challenged but I was able to learn from students firsthand um, how so many of those challenges were directly linked to bias and stereotyping and anti-blackness so you can see how um, the educators are really creating that situation for themselves, but locating the problem within the black youth. Um, so I can go on to my next slide. It's just my final thoughts. Reflecting back on my K to 12 and high uh, K to 12 and work experiences allowed me to really think about um, the ways that surveillance operates in the lives of black disabled young people, how it's normalized in educational settings that I grew up in and uh, yeah, it really allowed me also to mine my own life for data that is often not documented in Canadian research related to the lived experience of Black disabled young people in education. Oftentimes that particular intersection of Blackness and disability and education is um, underrepresented in our scholarly, scholarly literature in Canada. Um, again, Canada likes to pretend that they're not racist and that we do not have a racism problem. So that's one of the reasons why that information is not always um, represented. So I, I wanted to really put forward those narratives because I think that that is important community knowledge and I think that it's highly relevant to the topic. Um, 
And as tools, tactics, and strategies to surveil young Black people in schools become more and more advanced, I think it's really important for those of us who are in a position to challenge this to do so. So I hope all these narratives uh, really make a strong case for why that's necessary. And I thank you all so much for listening. I am finished with my presentation. I'm gonna turn off my video now. Thank you so much for that uh, really thoughtful presentation, Jasmine. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to take a quick break for the ASL interpreter before I give a few more thoughts and introduce our next speaker. This is Adil speaking. I see that we have our second ASL interpreter on the screen. I'm just going to ask that the ASL interpreter fix the video kindly. It's Adil and Dunn speaking. And Daniel, if you're okay, it's Adil speaking. If you're okay that I continue, I can, or we can wait for the second interpreter. Please let me know. It's Adil, I'm done speaking. Great, it's Adil speaking, and I guess uh, we'll go ahead and continue. So um, just before I go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Yasmin, thank you so much. Your presentation brought up such important and, and crucial points about the metrics of surveillance for Black youth um, within, within K-12. to um, I really appreciate the way that you distilled what that experience was from the classroom, from the ways in which, um, or, or sorry, how people and teachers surveil students, assess students. Um, what I thought was really interesting was the way that you talked about how that surveillance extended onto the surveillance of student social media, um, using the uh, example of Damien. Um, I also really like the way that you um, illustrated how police can readily enter in the classroom and engage that uh, Somali youth that you spoke about um, and, the, and, and how he didn't know uh, whether or not it was appropriate, for example, and, and how um, those kinds of trespasses occur quite, quite daily um, in, in the K-12 uh, setting. I really appreciated also the way that you use Damien's uh, case study and that narrative to really have us and like walk us through his experiences. Um, a few things really stuck out for me. Um, one of the things that you said, and I'm going to quote, I think is you said, um, his ability to garner empathy, right? And so isn't that so interesting that um, that provoked a particular kind of response that other students were empathetic towards him. This, as you described, Black disabled um, young man in the classroom. Um, 
And especially, I also appreciate the way that you talked about um, how that incident of him kissing his girlfriend, both um, as a black man, but I think, you know, I I would add and also like e extend um, the ways that like disabled people's like desires are contained and also surveilled. And I wonder, and maybe you can speak to this a bit later on about how that also impacted that relationship as well. Um, and I think finally, something else that just struck me from your presentation, it was so uh, critical was how you spoke about your experiences and the use of CCTV um, camera within your high school and how and, and, and the impact of that. Um, and it made me think about an article that I actually recently read about um, the campus in which I work, Toronto Metropolitan University, um, written in the eye opener, actually, that uh, spoke about 16 new CCTV cameras being installed on campus, as well as like two kinds of intercoms on a particular street, Gould Street. Um, and this is supposed to be responding to issues of like um, unsafety on campus and, you know, this kind of uh, use of CCTV and intercom surveillance um, is currently happening uh, on this campus alongside um, particularly mad, disabled, racialized um, working class students um, really struggling against increased policing on campuses, which you also addressed in your presentation. So. Thank you so much for your presentation, Jasmine. And I have several questions, like I indicated, that I'm happy to continue to talk to you about um, during the question and answer period. Um, so next, I'm I'm going to go on to. Uh, I'd like to now welcome our uh, introduce our third and final presenter. Excuse me, pardon me, uh, Dr. C. N. Wilson. Uh, Dr. C.N. Wilson has over a decade of experience working within racialized communities across the greater Toronto area, first as a youth programmer and now as a health researcher doing work across the country um, in her current role as associate professor at Wilfrid Laurier University. Her body of work aims to utilize research as an avenue for sharing the stories of uh, st stories and realities of Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities for the improvement of uh, for the improvement of health and well being. Uh, I'd like to welcome you, Cien, uh, onto the conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adele. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and thank you again, Adil, for inviting me to this space. Uh, you are a sister, a collaborator, a co-liberator. Um, I just want to thank you and appreciate you so much for creating this platform for us. I also want to thank um, my co-panelists, co um, Yasmin and Tanitia, um, for uh, really highlighting some really sobering, I think, realities Um uh, as as black folks um uh in, in terms of how surveillance op surveillance operates uh in this space and place um uh, that we call the Canadian nation state um in, in terms of uh myself I go by she her pronouns so I just wanted to to start off there um uh and in in taking the leadership from um my co-panelists I will describe uh myself I am a black identifying uh, woman that hails from the Caribbean um, Jamaica in particular. Uh, today, my hair is out. Uh, my hair is really curly. I've got big hair. So I've got uh, big curly hair that's out right now. And I'm wearing um, an off-white cream colored turtleneck with some drawstrings. Um, uh, and my background is blurred. Um, and there's lots of things going back on, <laughs> on back in the background. So I won't uh, describe too much about um, all of the things in the background. But um, that's a little bit about um, physically how I look uh, for for those new to this that description, um, I uh, as Idil um, highlighted, um, I'm a community health researcher by training, um, and I was I, I trained in the environmental health uh, research program or environmental studies program at uh, York University, um, and a lot of my work, as was highlighted, really focuses on the health and well being of Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities, and some of what I'll highlight. Uh, for you today complements what Yasmin and Tanitia uh, spoke about um, uh, in, in terms of what's happening our in our communities from a post-secondary space. Um, uh, and so I think it's a good complement for, uh, for the other spaces and institutions that were spoken about uh, from the different lenses today. 
Um, how I come to this work, I, I should say, because I think that's where my story begins and, and where I really wanted to enter into the conversation today. Um, in being a, a health researcher and really starting out actually in sexual and reproductive health, and in particular with a focus on HIV research, um, at the time, very much like Tanitia spoke about, all of the data that's out there that's created about Black-skinned folks in particular, um, uh, Indigenous folks, I think, second to that, um, you know, if you read sexual health research, it is incredibly stereotyping of our communities. We're always a problem that needs to be fixed, a risk that needs to be managed. Uh, our bodies as Black, uh, uh, Black-skinned people and Black people um, uh, you know, are constantly under surveillance in so many ways. And research is one of those prime ways. Um, it's not uh, for not that, that uh, you know, research has been regarded as a vector for colonization, right? And, and also a vector for anti-Blackness. And so, um, you know, all of these um, things that you're hearing, whether it's in, a, a, you know, an elementary school or in high school, uh, you know, setting or in research from the academy, these things are resounding trends that you see um, within uh, the research space and within the research literature. Um, and so in, in noticing that overwhelming negative connotation to how our bodies are described, how our sexualities are described, the type of sex we're having, how much sex we're having, um, you know, as young uh, Black folks or just Black people more generally, these were the really, um, I think, touch points that got me very interested in my area of study um, uh, as a health researcher and wanting to do research that um, spoke back to that stereotyping and, and talked about our lived experience as Black people to humanize us, um, to talk about our realities and nuance that discussion, that we're not just a statistic of risk. We're not just, um, uh, you know, diseased Black people. Um, there are many more complex realities. There's also the reality that we don't, uh, you know, a lot of health research I find is incredibly, one, uncritical, and two, never takes into account the role of colonization, the role of systemic and structural factors in talking about, um, you know, the, the realities that communities are facing and what puts communities at risk, um, and anti-Blackness being one of them. <laughs> so um, for me, a lot of my work has been uh, seeded in um, really speaking back and, uh, and, and, and centering our voices as Black, Indigenous, and racialized people. And I think that that is one of the central things that sort of uh, pulls um, my work together. And now how do I come to the work around, uh, you know, the theme of, this of, of today's discussion, radical responses to surveillance in education? Um, so again, remember, I come from a sexual and reproductive health background, HIV being a focus. I'll give you, um, you know, uh, I'll set some some uh, a setting here, a scene. I'm setting a scene for my story here um, where I, uh, along with some of my colleagues, Idil was one of them, um, we were at a conference. Um, There's a big national HIV conference across Canada every single year. And in 2017, this conference so happened to be held in Montreal. And so we all, as Black scholars, independent Black scholars, went to this conference. Now, HIV being the world in which my research is nested, I know this world very well. I know all of the players. What was evident and has been evident for the better part of the last decade is that HIV and health research, much like education research, much like social work research, and many other uh, you know, sectors and fields of research, is predominantly populated by white researchers um, who are doing research um, uh, on non-white communities. That's often the dynamic that you see in a lot of this type of scholarship. And at this conference, that was definitely one of the dynamics. And it was so pronounced um, that you saw a lot of white researchers, the only black people there other than us as independent scholars, a and it was a small little group of independent scholars that include the likes um, uh, of Adil, as I mentioned, Lana James, um, Ronaldo Walcott and others, a small group of us as independent um, black scholars. Beyond our small little caucus that came together, the only other black people in that research space were participants in a study 
participants thus of study. Um, they were often people who identified as being impacted by the HIV epidemic. Um, and they were they were essentially participants of study, uh, subjects to be studied in that space, and were literally hauled out to this conference by white researchers to tell their story, traumatizing and often triggering um, stories about um, their HIV experience. That was the only dynamic that we saw other Black people in, in that conference. And so I, that I wanted to share that story to just create a really vivid image of the relationship between race and research, and in particular, anti-Blackness in research and health research in a really specific way, and the dynamics there. It was so pronounced that one of our colleagues, um, Ronaldo Walcott, regarded it as a plantation logic. And what he, I, I interpreted that he meant by plantation logic is, again, you have white masters and the only black people there are are there in in servitude to the black to the to the white masters, right? So, really thinking about um, you know Ronaldo Walcott's plantation logics and that terminology and how he brings that brought that that analysis into that space. Now, from that conference, what some really useful I think things you know came out of that experience and our witnessing. Of, of what was happening in that space. And one of those pivotal things that came out of that was a convening of uh, Black community folks, Black researchers, anyone who was Black in the space. We gathered together and we gathered together in public, not in private, in public, um, which created a tremor throughout um, the conference. Uh, when Again, when more than two of us are gathered, as Yasmin sort of alluded to, there seems to be a worry it freaks white folks out in institutions where white supremacy sort of reigns. And this space was no different. You know, Black people got together, we were speaking in public, we were sharing experiences and thinking about the dynamics that we were all sort of noticing. Um, and it created a tremor, uh, you know, throughout uh, the, the um, conference, both then and since then. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, again, just sort of, sort of alluding to the power of that moment, but also what it meant for this predominantly white space. Um, and out of that, um, you know, uh, conversation amongst Black folks, what was decided was that uh, one of our, our research partners, um, Lana James, would lead a, a protocol um, uh, to, to on, um, uh, you know, uh, research on Black communities. So Lana has been working away at this protocol. I've been, uh, you know, helping to steward that particular process um, uh, in, in terms of coming up with a protocol that really focuses on the protection of Black people in research. So very similar, like you see in Indigenous communities with an OCAP principle, what would it look like to have a guidelines and some guiding principles um, on um, protecting uh, Black communities um, from, from really exploitative research? Um, from that work um, uh, that is ongoing, one of the other uh, uh, projects that that I've been a part of leading alongside um, Lana, of which Adil is also a part of, uh, as a more recent, is a project that um, builds on um, the importance of this black protocol for for Black communities, uh, to looking at other protocols that have been community created around the world. So when we look at Australasia, when we look at Polynesia, uh, when we look in um, continental Africa and other regions around the world where indigenous uh, and black folks are, are creating their own protocols for protection against exploitative research, what are the best and the wise practices that we can pull from all of these, this work uh, amongst community um, a, a, to imp impact and impart on um, po research policy and practice and programming here in Canada? Um, and it's really an important process, uh, you know, to, to centering um, what community created protocols um, uh, are are sort of in, in, you know saying uh, and 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 what the intention of them are. Uh, these are really this is a really important project in the sense that uh, what we want to do is make sure that community voices and perspectives are really centered in research, especially communities that are over researched and are often the subject matter of research. Um, and so that is one of the big intentions of this. Um, I've also just recently applied to um, 
uh, get one project funded and, and the hopes that it will be uh, to pilot test the implementation of this work at my institution, my home institution, which is Laurier, uh, where, which is in Waterloo, Ontario, um, to pilot test, well, how do we practically now implement these best and wise practices um, into uh, a, an institution's, you know, research uh, review process and its policies and its protocols? And how does this then get rolled out? And how do faculty and other researchers get trained on, on, on ethical research with um, Black and Indigenous communities? And so this is a, an international uh, process, an international project of, of again, gathering um, these best and wise practices and then actually looking at, a, you know, a case example of how that is implemented at an institution for further rollout and scale up beyond um, the academic institution. Um, and by and large, I would say that it's one of the most, um, I think, important projects that I'm I'm able to be a part of and to support along with a really phenomenal group uh, of, of um, you know, scholars and activists and lawyers and, uh, and folks that are really passionate about protecting our communities in the research industrial complex. And like Esme, uh, sorry, like Tanitia had mentioned, yes, I'm a part of the system. I'm a researcher. And so my objective here is I do believe that research can go beyond just observing us and our deaths and observing us dying. I do believe that research can be an intervention um, into, uh, you know, impacting uh, in a positive way, the material conditions of our lives. I do believe, like my Indigenous colleagues uh, would say, that research can be reconciliatory and research for reconciliation. Research can be these things. Research can be transformation and transformative. Why can't it be these things? And oftentimes what we find is that it is us as Black, Indigenous, and racialized people who have to you know, lead the charge in terms of changing what we are demanding that research is. Um, and it's through, uh, you know, this project, this larger project, that I'm able to, to be a part of that process um, in, in doing this. Um, what I will, uh, you know, share is that, you know, it, it being and having worked in this field as long as I have, um, there have been some really trauma traumatizing, um, uh, you know, and uh, you know, research projects that have been conducted in our communities, especially in sexual and reproductive health, um, that are nothing short of violent. Um, where our biological samples are being collected. We're not sure where they're stored. We're not sure how they're being used and reused or bought and sold. And this is a larger problem um, as we also see corporate and private interests now descending upon data collection and research and big data. Um, and so when you think about all of this and you sort of see the sort of um, surmounting surveillance when it comes to data collection and, 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 and extraction from our communities, we must be concerned and we must be alarmed, especially as Black people, especially as Indigenous folks um, and, and racialized folks. We must be alarmed because we know that it is our bodies on which this violence is actually evoked. And we know that it is our bodies that are being over surveilled. And so uh, I do believe that this work is important. Um, and while being done in the public sector, because it is a public, publicly funded institution that I'm a part of, the hope is that you know, that we will have some uh, reach um, uh, to impact data collection of all sorts. And so, uh, you know, these are the ways that we vision and build our futures and build together and collectively and collaboratively as Black and Indigenous folks. Um, and, and this is the little piece of the world that we can, like, that I feel I can impart some change on and work with my colleagues, um, such as Lana um, and Idil and others, uh, to impart change. And so, you know, uh, wanting to shed light on some of the work that we're doing in the post-secondary sector, um, um, uh, to impart change in these little ways. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this work lands on the back of Black people. And I'll also highlight Black women, uh, uh, by and large. And so also highlighting, um, you know, just, just some of, of those pieces. I'll pause there, Idil, in terms of um, what I wanted to share. And I want us to, you know, engage in further conversations about some of these topics, as I know the questions that you have uh, do, in fact, unpack some of these issues a little bit further. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Wilson. I really appreciate um, your contributions. And like everybody else, wow, uh, so many things, so many things to say. Um, I think one of the like really quick connections that I want to make between um, 
um, Yasmin's presentation, Jasmine's presentation, and, and your presentation as well, um, is also the connection between activism um, and, and research and the way that these two are connected. So for example, I think about um, the phenomenal work of education, not incarceration, um, and the way those um, uh, activists uh, who are also educators, that are also family members, that are also researchers, that are and um, members um, of, of, of the community have really impacted responses to, for example, um, uh, the SRO program here, as well as um, the ongoing debates with returning uh, SROs, either in their formal or informal uh, ways into, um, into the TDSB. Um, I also think about um, the work of Ready for Black Lives, um, which is also a research and activist um, space that you talked about, again, led by uh, Lana James and yourself, um, and the links that the links that that makes to sort of really kind of looking at um, everyday kind of responses and really thinking about how that work is produced quickly and accessibly for the public. Um, as well as, um, you know, re response to research as well. So, and thank you as well for your connections around big data um, and more specifically having us really think about um, how big data uh, links to our research and our research programs. Um, and for me specifically, I think about, for example, how uh, venture capitalists uh, are linked to, for example, uh, currently like high numbers of like calls for research funding um, that are also then connected to things like being able to disclose, um, you know, participant GI, GI tracking location as a part of receiving funding for that particular body, um, as you know, being able to disclose like other kinds of um, information that maybe participants wouldn't know. So I really appreciate kind of you bringing us back to the idea of uh, research, um, as well as really the idea of guarding and protecting Black communities and thinking about what that looks like in terms of a protocol. And thank you for giving me case example um, of we know of uh, pre-existing pre-existing protocols. So um, it looks like we may have some questions already um, within the uh, Q&A. So um, I'm going to maybe ask if um, uh, uh, either Amber, I don't know, Amber, uh, if, you're, if, if you're available to maybe have a read through the uh, question, uh, some of the questions for the panelists, if you're available to do so. And if not, maybe if I can ask uh, Tally to go through some of the questions. So Amber or Tally, and we can use a pause right now for the ASL interpreter. So we'll be back in two minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Well, 
I mean, is it okay to start the questions now, Daniel? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, just looking through the questions in our question and answer box, and I will start with this question to all the panelists. What are ways we can push as part of a larger provincial strategy to disrupt surveillance by big data? One of the multiple ways policing and carcerality in educational spaces shows up. Should the focus be on introducing new legislation, amendments to current legislation, or otherwise, or otherwise to ensure it does not continue to happen across all educational spaces, spaces including the sharing of data? Hi, hi, Dr. Wilson, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I, I can start us off maybe um, in, in a response. I, I'd like us to remember that um, Google tried to build an alphabet city of surveillance right here in Toronto uh, in the Lakeshore area. And the, the people who live in that area and other concerned citizens riled up, <laughs> they went to every town hall meeting and they let their opinions be known that they were not interested in this kind of surveillance in their neighborhood. Um, and Google retreated. Um, uh, so I, I think there's something to be said about storming the streets and, you know, uh, raising your voice um, through activist, um, you know, uh, circles um, and interventions um, that goes a very long way in having um, and taking up space and ma in making that be known, right? Writing to your local politicians and so on and so forth, uh, because we've seen that it works. I think one of the concerns that I have um, is one, I find that um, Canadians can, in general can be a, a little complacent uh, when it comes to things that are of interest to them and things that should be should make them angry, that they should be storming the streets for privatizing healthcare, we should be storming the streets because for so many um, you know eons and decades, healthcare, a public healthcare system was one of the staples of our uh, country more broadly and certainly our province. Um, but there's a lot of complacency, and I think adding to that. Um, is you have a lot of folks who don't feel um, entitled to ask for things. As racialized folks, as Black folks, um, we don't feel uh, entitled to ask for, uh, you know, a public health care system, for example, or to demand that we're not surveilled. We don't feel we have an entitlement to ask for those things because so much of the Canadian, I think, rhetoric is that we should all, as racialized people who immigrated here, um, we should all be happy to be here. We should all just be happy to be here and be glad that we're here and not where we are countries of origin, right? Completely negating that oftentimes it is Western influence, not excluding Canada, uh, in the upheaval of our countries of origins that have displaced so many Indigenous people around the world in, and have le led to our migrations to places like this, right? Uh, so, you know, the West con consistently in the international community in the West in particular, consistently um, creates and wreaks havoc in other parts of the world and then complains when the implications of that are that you have, um, you know, political refugees, uh, asylum seekers, immigrants, refugees, so so on and so forth, right? The whole um, gambit of, 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 of reasons that people migrate here um, often uh, are rooted in, in colonialism. So all to say is that I'm concerned that in general as a as as a as a Canadian public we we don't we we we, we operate in a very uh, I think complacent um approach to to political decisions that do directly impact us. And then on top of that the additional layer is for folks who are not indigenous and uh and even those who are indigenous um, uh, I, I find that racialized and Indigenous folks, by and large, do not feel entitled to demand things of their government, to demand things um, of their political leaders. Um, uh, and so we sort of find ourselves in this very bewildering um, place where these policies are pushed um, 
uh, in, in, in communities that are not Lakeshore, where there aren't rich white folks who are raising hell, uh, in, in communities uh, like St. Jamestown or, you know, uh, communities where, that are low income and predominantly racialized. So I think these are, you know, some of the challenges that I think uh, are the reality for us around big data uh, is that go, going back to our tried and trusted raising hell approaches of, of, of political activism, I think goes a long way. It's um, hi, it's Adil speaking. I just think it, this would be like a perfect time, CN, given that you just finished with like raising hell um, for me to maybe share uh, that this uh, on January 24th, actually, there is going to be a protest and march um, in the city of Toronto in order to oppose John Tory's $50 million budget increase to the police services. And so I think that um uh, we'll we'll share this certainly on our um, on uh, on our Black Oculars uh, website, Black Oculars Twitter page. But I think just given the the, the discussion that we've heard today, um, in terms of how surveillance um, is currently uh, in in operation, um, the impacts of that and what we may need, I think that uh, you know this may be an opportunity for us to really think about like how can we have our voices heard we know that there have been deputations at the police board for example we know that recently there was um other deputations at city hall uh and and we need to think about that i think um as as people living in the city in fact who um you know you know in the context of the increased uh, mayoral power so i see that um cn this, Cien's hand is up, and then I'll go ahead and give it back again to Amber. Cien, uh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm I just speaking. wanted to to build on that I, I, and and say that like in Waterloo region, which is where I'm situated, um, I'm supporting and I'm a part of the African Caribbean and Black Network out here. Um, and some of the things that we're doing are you know being a part of delegations at uh, regional council meetings and voicing our opposition to the police budget increase in our region as well, because it's across the board. It's not just happening in Toronto. Police budgets are increasing year over year at, at an at a, at an astronomical rate in terms of what that then means for the taxpayer, um, and uh, strategizing with other groups. So I do encourage folks just to build on this topic. Um, great sort of you know cause around um, the increasing po policing and surveillance budget uh, is to absolutely you know join you know look at what local organizations are doing. Maybe join a movement, support an an initiative, um, or you know again um, just sign up to be a delegate at council meetings uh, to oppose these decisions, um, despite uh, Mayor Tory's um, more recent um, increase and in inflated power as, you know, as, as given to him by Doug Ford and being a super mayor or whatever the terminology is now that uh, that he has. Um, so yeah, absolutely, just to build on that, that topic of the ways that people can get involved um, and to raise their voice around these concerning trends. Thank you so much, Cien. I see that there's been a, it's a deal speaking, that there's been a request for a break for the ASL interpreter. So we'll go ahead and take a quick two minute break and resume in two minutes, Amber. Thank you. It's a deal, I'm done speaking.
Hello, everyone. And we're back with questions and answers. Um, I'd like to go to Tanitia. Um, in your presentation, you brought up some of the challenges of being seen as sort of like a singular person doing this type of research or doing this type of work in a particular community. And I was wondering if you could speak more to those challenges and how you sort of work through that. Uh, certainly. Um, I think um, as a Black queer woman, the task um, is inflicted with multiple challenges, you know, as a, you know, I feel sometimes I'm an insider outsider because I I I am never far removed from my community, right? And I'm always thinking of myself um, in terms of my experiences. And I go back to being a, a parent and what I used to negotiate and experience, or what my kids used to negotiate and experience. You know, um, when they when they were in K to twelve, right? Um, and um, for me, you know, I reflect on how my experiences connect and diverge in the community and the in institution. Um, you know, and I also think about um, that rarely um, we work out of isolation. And I was um, listening to Sian um, and, you know, and her sharing um, her work and the community, the folks in the community that she works with. Um, um, and I was, you know, nodding away and, and also thinking about um, how um, my work in the community and in the institution um, are, aren't almost, aren't always, sorry, um, developed through dialogue, right? And I have to be intentional about that and reminding myself that I am I come from community, you know, I, I'm representing um, community voices, especially understanding most um, times they're erased, they're silenced in um, K-12 spaces, you know, and, you know, there's also um, something that I, I think about, you know, I remind myself of and is the ways in which um, as black women researchers, um, we literally train, we're literally um, trained away from ourselves, right? For many of us with little resistance or critical examination of how um, the training that we know, we, you know, um, shaped our pedagogies and our approaches to research. So um, it's undoing um, a lot of that, um, you know, and also asking myself, you know, when I look at a document, when I look at a data set, you know, what are the tensions, the history, the cultural experience, diversities, the nuances, the relationships that um, I have to think about um, in my position as a researcher, right? So that's my answer, that's my response. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um... Quickly, Daniel, do you need another break? Great, thank you. Um, so I also wanted to ask that question to, or open up that question to Yasmin and Dr. Wilson as well, this idea of isolation and, or that feeling of isolation and sort of like the heralds of representation in a way, um, but also to tie that on to a question in the chat. What are some ways that you think educators, parents, caregivers, and students can effectively resist surveillance in schools, especially police interactions like the one that you shared, Yasmin? Um, thank you for that question. I'm going to respond to it now. I'll try to speak slowly for the interpreter and the others listening as well. Um, <clears throat> it's funny thinking uh, in hindsight, like what I would have done or what I wish could have been done, would have been done at the time that these things were happening 
over a decade ago, like during my K to eight experiences, one thing that I personally think would have been funny and also um, really powerful, a really powerful display of solidarity is many children went home and told their parents everything that had happened that day. It was a very significant day in our, in our educational lives. Again, like our grade eight teacher hadn't been with us for the entire day and there was a lot of gossip around what was happening. I think it would have been really effective and powerful of parents, for example, of every child in that grade eight classroom, every child in the grade seven classroom as well, who was, who, who was a privy to what was happening, wrote their own Facebook posts in solidarity with Damien or even directly against the grade eight teacher. Because again, that episode was truly unnecessary. And every everybody who heard the situation after the fact felt that way, right? So I think it would have been useful if they had made those social media posts themselves, printed them off, left them right at her, her classroom doorstep. Like, why not? This That's like one way that we can resist. In terms of um, the other narrative I'd shared around uh, the, the narrative around the student who was being added on Facebook by the, the cop, but not before the cop had characterized him as, you know, this, this threatening and scary person. I think, again, the educator in that room should have resisted, not, not, not just as an individual, but like band together with teachers to not have police in our school anymore if they're going to come and, in, and treat Black students the way that we saw. If that display was any indication, and it was, because that was truly part of the, the police officer's mandate and presentation, and it wasn't like it was unplanned, it was completely planned, that should not be acceptable in school. So I think that like coming up with creative and, um, you know, ways that are authentic to, to community, you know, are certainly uh, good strategies for resistance. And in terms of the other experience I talked about around uh, being an educator, like an after school educator and having teachers who would just, just checking in, just sitting, just checking in as they'd say. Um, like one thing that students, that we led students through is like, we'd be like, okay, students, it's time to meditate. <laughs> and we would sit there in silence, meditating until the teacher left. And again, these are funny things because it was an inside joke between um, the facilitators and the students, but it was also effective at getting the teachers who wanted to, you know, be nosy and figure out what's going on in the program to be like, oh, I'm just going to excuse myself because they were bored. So these are all um, maybe like non-conventional forms of resistance, but I really do think that they are effective and I hope that's helpful as an answer. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Yasmin. Um, yeah, I'll sort of tag in on that. Um, uh, thanks so much, Yasmin. Those are really great examples. I also have some good examples just from out here in Waterloo Region. Um, so I, one of my students um, who's uh, a master's student is actually doing work uh, with uh, young people in high schools, uh, young Black and Indigenous folks in particular, um, who uh, actually on their own um, staged a, a, a huge protest and like wrote a call to action and a call out of their uh, school board um, around the SRO program in Waterloo Region. And so in Waterloo, currently the SR program, SRO program has been paused. <laughs> um, obviously, there have been, been many efforts made by our local police force to um, reinsert themselves into the schools. A lot of the ways that we see that happening is, you know, on mainstream media, almost every week, you'll see a story about the police having to be on site, on location at a random high school because something popped off in the, in the high school amongst the students or whatever. Uh, so there's lots of, been, lots of media prop, like propaganda um, from police to reinsert themselves into schools, whether those, and most of these incidents, mind you, are not serious and don't actually require um, uh, uh, policing. But what we also find in Waterloo Region um, is that with the increasing um, number of colored students um, and, and, colored, and, and racialized families that are migrating to the region, we're finding more of an impetus from police to want to be in schools to, again, surveil our kids. I think it's a very interesting dynamic that we're in, though, that you have grown authoritative figures like police, who are in many ways uh, paramilitary trained, um, who want to have active and regular engagement with young 
with with school age children. I find that dynamic really interesting and really puzzling and uh, and problematic for a number of reasons. And the fact that they want to, they're actually fighting the students who who again did this call to action and their program was paused. They're actually fighting what students want, what what black and racialized students want uh, in their own education space. So I think that that's a very interesting dynamic that we find ourselves in. Like young people are saying. We don't want this thing. It is, um, you know, it, it, it is very uh, uncomfortable. It's very exploitative. It's very strange. We don't want this thing. Um, it's very violent. Um, but police are using propaganda and through all the powers that they're able to, to reinsert themselves. So we have this dynamic and, and we're kind of at a crossroads where this um Discussion is a hot topic for discussion, even in Waterloo Region, and it continues. But all to say that students are leading the way, the future generations are leading the way in so many ways to um, oppose this kind of surveillance structure in their places of learning, right? Spaces that are supposed to be places of learning. Um, to answer the other question that you did pose, um, around how is it, you know, the work and being isolating. Yeah, so on the one hand, yes, this work is absolutely isolating. Until um, last year, I was the only Black faculty in the entire faculty of science at my institution, uh, which is a shameful fact. Um, in 2022 and, and now 2023. Um, uh, and I was a part of hiring the next racialized person, an Afro-Indigenous person um, from out, uh, out uh, in Nova Scotia. Um, and so, uh, you know, just just that reality, I think, is is isolating in and of itself that this work is often often we are the only ones in the spaces and places that we're in doing the kinds of work that we are doing in the way that we do it, which is very community oriented, very community based uh, and community led and collaboratory in a lot of ways. Um, so there is that aspect of isolation, but I do take sol like solace in the fact that like, you know, I'm training students that are doing really dope work um, with, you know, high school students and the next generation of, of racialized and black scholars are hopefully going to have a lot more commune to commune about a, a lot more opportunity to commune because I am where I am, because I'm in this position, I'm able to, you know, hopefully um, make the, the path uh, for uh, racialized and indigenous uh, students to become faculty and that the next generation will be, uh, will at least have, there would be a few a few more of us um, hanging around. So on that point of isolation, um, that's where, what I hold on to is the promise of the future. And um, uh, yeah, and, and so that, I hope that answers that question um, in, in terms of, you know, the, the training of the next generation of scholars and, and what that can look like and the promise that I think is is absolutely there. I want to add one quick thing to that question as well. Um, or I think someone posted, Ari and Judy posted, like, what are some ways you think educators, parents, and students can effectively resist surveillance in schools? Uh, especially police interactions. And I think that that was raised in the last question as well. So I wanted to say like, if uh, parents have capacity and availability, uh, it can be really important to show up to consultations or open meetings that are hosted through your school board. Some of them remain virtual for the time being. I'm most familiar with the kind of consultations that take place at the TDSB. In early December, there was a consultation around um, like the possibility and potential of reintroducing the SRO program. And I will tell you as somebody who listened to what I believe was like a four hour meeting, it was a long time. A lot of parents and caregivers who are in support of police, they show up, they show up and they, they make their case for why they feel police are needed in schools. And um, other folks who are who, who do not share that position and myself, I do not share that position, sometimes are underrepresented at those calls. And there's so many factors around that. Sometimes it really is to do with the school boards not putting out the information early enough for people to really attend and be there. Other times it's just that people have real lives and other commitments and it can be hard. It's not always, um, the timing of these types of consultations is not always amenable. And like I said, four hours is what I spent unpaid listening to this consultation. But my point is if it's within your ability to attend or if you you know can, can get connected with other parents to kind of share that responsibility, share that um, on a rotating basis, those are really important spaces to make your voice heard and to be able to challenge, um, what, like to really challenge these myths around how police makes us safer because we know that that is not the case, right? Thank you.
Thank you so much, everyone. We're going to take just a short breath um, before we come back for final question, final comments. Um, so we're just going to take a quick break. Thank you. Hi, Daniel. Are we okay to continue? Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say thank you again for all, to all of our speakers for sharing their brilliant work and their um, ideas and strategies and criticisms and visions around how research can be done in Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities differently. And just sort of like as a final question and like an opportunity to share any final comments you might have, I just wanted to turn to this question. Um, how do we continue to move towards developing research involving Black, Indigenous and racialized folks that is productive, responsible, meaningful, and helps further the wellness of individuals and communities? I think you've all touched on this in different ways from different perspectives in your talks, if you'd just like to share any final words, um, any final resources that you think um, students, teachers, community members can turn to, um, that would be great. Thank you so much. I don't see any of my co-panelists co unmuting, so I will. Um, so I think, uh, one, you heard about uh, community-based research and Tanitia mentioned YPAR. These are some uh, great frameworks for doing work, uh, approaches for doing research uh, that do um, have the tenet and the value of centering the communities that we're working with. So centering the perspectives and the voices of community in research and what communities want to see research done on in their communities. Um, as well as what is beneficial and building those meaningful relationships with communities over time, uh, which, you know, from the work that we've all sort of talked about, these come from relationships, right? Yasmin is not able to impact and do the work that she's able to do um, with the young people that she works with if she doesn't build and hasn't built meaningful relationships. That's why she can get through to these young people and work with these young people in a way that they're, even their educators, their teachers cannot Um so meaningful relationships are pivotal to this work and doing this work well, um, and being immersed in communities. Uh, and I and as as mentioned, you've got YPAR and CDR, uh, which were two approaches, uh, two you know a few approaches that were mentioned uh, in terms of the ways that we can um, you know approach this kind of work uh, with the communities that we're working with. Um, I also wanted to build on topic of. Um, of surveillance that was sort of mentioned um, in, in research and how do we, for me, how do we oppose that in research? How do we engage in research practices that oppose surveillance? One of the things that I've you know, started to, to quickly realize um, in the work that, that I'm a part of is that because so much of the, the new wave of surveillance is digital, it's digital surveillance, right? It's AI, it's uh, big data, it's uh, this kind of digital um, uh, route to surveilling everything that we do, right? Uh, everything that we eat, the way that we behave, all of these things are now being psychologized from a dig from, from digital documentation, essentially. Um, and so one of the ways to oppose that in our own work is to go back to the basics, almost go, go back to the manual, to the 
um, the non-digital version. So I had this conversation with a researcher recently, instead of recording your interviews on Zoom, what would it look like to record on an audio recorder, uh, then anonymize through transcription, not a transcription software, hire a transcriber um, to, who can, you know, make sure all of the, the transcripts are completely emptied of, of identifying information before it's stored on a storage drive it, through an institution, which is often where we have to store uh, research. Um, because then there's more steps in order to find out who this person is, in order to surveil who this participant might be, there are more steps that the surveillance system has to go through and more hoops they have to jump through to be able to do that. Versus what we often do is we defer to technology to transcribe, to record, which are all markers that can be used to surveil us. And so going back to the basics, um, I find is a very uh, important way uh, of audio recording and transcribing manually and collecting data in more manual formats versus digital uh, to oppose the re the surveillance um, uh, mechanisms as they are. Because so many of those surveillance mechanisms are based on the idea of digital surveillance, so digitizing everything, to make it, quote unquote, convenient easier to deal with and easier to um, get, you know, uh, to store and and all of the sort of, you, you know, utility arguments for, for digital surveillance, I think, can be made. Um, but in, in all of the ease and, um, you know, uh, convenience, it also means it's easier to take, steal, uh, share and reshare, um, all of which um, can create really problematic um, dynamics for our communities in terms of surveillance. So going back to the manual, undigitizing things, creating more layers um, of uh, of barriers for uh, between um, the system and and the you know the communities that we're working with ultimately, I think is one way to sort of uh, counteract some of this. So I will go next. Um, I think. Um, we need to think about the ways in which um, data travels through institution and become like policies, part of policies, practices, relationships, fights, identities. It's like a virus, it just travels, right? And I think um, it's re-envisioning a better use, um, better uses of data um, to break um, systems of oppression. Um, I also think about, um, you know, how researchers, scholars, policymakers, how they need to reevaluate the ways in which um, over-researched, yet underrepresented, undervalued, and under-resourced communities are consistently positioned, right? Um, there needs to be careful consideration, reconsiderations, and reframing of research and the portrayal um, of those who are historically like regulated and um, pushed to the margin. So we know who they are in, in, in K to 12 spaces um, and that reframing of it, you know, and, and that needs to inform um, policies, uh, future research and practice. Um, and, we also need to think about the ways um, data sets derived from past violence, for example, how it should be repurposed. Um, um, and in that repurposing, we have to name the harm that it did, right, in, in order for us to shift it. Um, so, um, and, and a, a thing I like talk about a lot um, when I am doing my own work um, again, and when I'm talking to my colleagues, is um, how we can do that. So that ethics of care that we can come, um, come with, because every number represents a child, every number represents uh, a family member, you know, a caregiver, a parent, you know, a staff, right? So, you know, what are we adding to these um, data points um, to better reflect the experiences and the identities um, of those numbers, right? How are we narrating it? Um, so um, for me personally, you know, that's part of my commitment um, in knowing that students, in how I represent students and their families um, 
in 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 my work. So I think it's more so reimagining, re-envisioning um, the use of data, and I, it, it it can be done. It can be done, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you so so much. Um, Yasmin, I just want to give you the opportunity to say like a one minute thing. Yes, I'll be brief. I agree with uh, the sentiments of both um, Cyan and Tanitia. I think it's important to just always consider why you're approaching a research question the way that you are, what lens you're using. Um, do you, does this research need to, does this research need to be done again? Like, as in, do we need it? Is it really innovative? Is it really new? Or are we simply asking a question that we actually already know the answer to? Again, if community members are reporting a specific problem over and over and over again, why do we need data to validate a concern? Why don't we just trust people? You know what I mean? I, I find one thing is like research sometimes is replicated over and over and over again, and then there's nothing done with it. So it's very poor, it's, in, it's of vital importance that in conducting research, there really is a plan for how then you're going to enact upon the results and really critically thinking about whether that research is, is truly important to do at that time, or if you're just replicating numbers for the sake of numbers. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that just makes me think of the idea of you, know, you can research something completely out of existence. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, that is, that's the end of our session today. And I turn it over to Dr. Idil Abdullahi, our fearless leader. <laughs> I'm dead. Okay. So, um, thank you so much, everybody. And in particular, oh, I'm going to try and do this with the camera on. Um, so thank you to today's panelists in particular. Thank you to Tanitia, Yasmin, and um, CN. I'd also like to thank, I'm going to turn the camera off really quickly. I'd also like to thank our previous panelists. And if you haven't had a chance to join those discussion lives, I'm going to invite you to join those discussions um, and follow the Black Oculars page as well as Twitter. Um, and YouTube where all of the discussions will be uploaded. I'd like to thank all of you for your continued attendance. Um, many of you initially signed up for the first five and have stuck with us throughout the entire five. So thank you to all of you. I'd especially like to thank our project team to begin with, um, Amber, uh, Apollo, and Maddie, um, uh, Tally, who's the DST Public Lab Coordinator, uh, Darren, who's currently working in the School of Disability Studies, um, Angie, who's our close captioner, Luke, um, AI Media, and all of our previous deaf and ASL interpreters. I'd also like to give a deep and sincere uh, thank you to my colleagues in the School of Disability Studies. Um, uh, and un it is particularly under the leadership of Esther that this project um, came to fruition and was respected and resourced. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you, um, as well as uh, anyone who um, has contributed to this project online. Thank you so much for participating. And we look forward to staying engaged with you. Have a great evening. This is Adil Abdullahi, and I'm done speaking.